This is Conspiranormal. Okay, guys, welcome back to Conspiranormal. And uh, it is the week or two weeks after the Strange Reality Conference. and uh, In this timeline that you are currently in. Yeah, hopefully. You had a blast at the Strange Realities Conference. Yes. And it went uh, perfectly with no hiccups. Is that uh, all about manifesting? Yeah, something yeah, like I th- that. I think so, yeah. We we're actually uh, we're actually in the studio together for like the first time in like six months. Yeah, yeah. It's we, crazy. We got our pod, I think that's what they call it. Yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah well, it's, it's the war room and we are preparing to um, go live with the conference on Friday night. Yeah, the war room for the conference that we just did. It's weird how that works. Yeah. Anyway, so we got a, we got a powerhouse in here tonight, guys. This kind of came together almost last minute, but I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll start uh, introducing everybody. I want to first introduce uh, Dave Altman, who's never been on this show. And Dave is the uh, Vice President of Media for the UAP, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Expedition Group, and a consultant for a lot of UFO paranormal TV series. Uh, Dave, welcome to Conspiranormal. Why, thank you, and I'm very happy and excited to be here. Huge fan of the show. Absolutely, man. Thanks. Thank you, too, for like setting this up tonight, uh, helping, us, helping us do that. Yeah, it was a Hail Mary scramble at the last minute, but uh, it's worked out for the best, actually. Yeah. No offense to the people that couldn't make it. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, we've also got on the line a a new person as well, that uh, Terry Carter, who is also a vice president of the Ancient Historical Research Foundation and a treasure hunter. So this Terry, welcome to Conspiracy Normal. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Hey, thank you for coming on. We appreciate you. We appreciate you doing this kind of last minute tonight. And this was kind of last minute. I just walked <laughs> in the door from work. <laughs> He's well, going to be grumpy and hungry. <laughs> we, hope you, we hope you enjoy the experience. Um, and also uh, coming to us all the way from uh, a state next door. Micah Hanks. Definitely not, definitely not a new uh, first-timer. No, definitely not. In fact, Micah was, I think, on our fifth episode. He was one of the first guests we ever had on Conspiracy Normal. Welcome, Micah. It's great to have you back, man. Gentlemen, always wonderful to be here in the hallowed halls of Conspiracy Normal. Uh, my only regret, of course, is that we are not actually there in person as we have been so many times. But, you know, I feel yes, very... Yeah, and and I feel this is a special occasion, you know, being uh, my good buddy Dave's first experience on the show, so I'm glad to be able to be here, and of course, Dave's been telling me about Terry, so I'm sure we've got a real good conversation lined up tonight. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, So, Dave, let's start with you, man. Uh, Do we have to? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we got to. (laughs) We we got to, we got to. so I've talked to you just kind of like, uh, you know, we've had a few phone conversations, but uh, kind of just, you know, I went down kind of just what the UAP expedition, we talked about UAP, mentioned UAP expedition group. That's let's let's like, just call it UAPX. It's a UAPX. lot easier. UAPX. That'll, <laughs> That'll work. That'll work. That'll work. <laughs> U- UAPS. UAPX. UAPS. So uh, let's talk about what that is, man, and what you guys do and what kind of like your goals are with it and who you have involved. Okay, um, so the UAPX, the UAP Expedition Group, um, came about as the brainchild of Kevin Day, who was one of the witnesses from the USS Tic Tac Nimitz encounter, Mm -hmm. or the USS Nimitz Tic Tac encounter, however you want to put it. Um, So Kevin, um, after the experience happened, one of his goals was to get back out to where it happened. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming everybody listening uh, knows about the, you know, the Tic Tac encounter, um, which was the UFO encounter that happened um, in the early 2000s out in the Pacific, uh, which had the Nimitz and the Princeton, the Navy, encountered some objects underwater and in the air was uh, the pilots were sent out to intercept and they were totally outmaneuvered and out 
sped, or however you want to put it, by these objects. Um, anyway, uh, Kevin put together a team to go back out to try and find where these things came from and possibly what they are. And he put together a group of physicists, um, NASA astronauts, Na a couple of uh, NASA astrobiologists, um, a whole scientific team to go back out there and try and collect scientific data on whatever these things are or were. And he also has um, a couple other veterans from the Navy that were out there from the Nimitz and Princeton, Princeton which are Gary Voorhees, Jason Turner, and PJ Hughes. He's got scientists like Kevin Knuth, um, NASA astronaut Christopher Altman, no relation. We have a <laughs> board of advisors, which has people like Rich Hoffman. Um, we've partnered with the group Skyhub, which is a um, UAP tracking team that has developed a new system. And it goes on and on. If people want to get the full idea, they can go to UAPExpedition.org and you'll see it there. Okay. That was a lot. Cool. Yeah. Well, there's a lot, you know, going on right now, especially yeah. with like the, all the UFO stuff. So, I mean, what uh, I know you personally, Dave, I know you kind of take a, you're, you're, pre, you're kind of on the uh, anti-ETH side of the, because you know, I know you listen to Joshua Cutchin and Timothy Renner, and you're, you're all into like uh, it's kind of like how we are about it, right? You know? Like looking not, at not things. Not to from say because you you have to add in the not to say it couldn't be aliens. <laughs> sure, right. We <laughs> yeah. we always got to leave ourselves open somehow. Like, Whatever right. that means. Yeah. I mean, there's all there's all kinds of possibilities. So I know like something like TTSA. I know they're they're kind of more. I guess you could say they're more on the ETH side. So. Do some of these guys? I know you got like I think you got Preston Dennett involved with right. this too, and I did right. Yeah, and I just want to I just want to say that. I just want to mention you know that that opinion is my opinion, not the group's opinion. You know, everybody has their own opinion. Yeah, in my opinion. But that's but that's good though because it'll right. give everybody kind of like everybody can kind of like throw these ideas around and they can they can work with each other and they can have uh, differing viewpoints and I think it'll really make things good. It's not just a bunch of like guys saying yeah that's what it is. So uh, with that kind of in mind, like you know, do you have do you guys have like some really good discussions as far as like how that goes like what what are some what are some viewpoints that get bandied about about what the phenomenon is well you know because of of us not being able to get out there now because of the you know the covid situation right um and when i first you know joined the, the group um i started doing my you know my own kind of well not just my own but more for the team and for myself um research on on the area so I kind of just busted out the laptop and, and uh, did some Googling and some searches. And I contacted uh, a bunch of um, fishing captains and, and whaling captains because they have the whale watches out there. Yeah. So I, I contacted pretty much every single one of them that are out in the San Diego, Catalina Island area, mm -hmm. as well as all of the newspapers in that area, um, like the Catalina Island, I think it's the Catalina Island Reporter. And, you know, people have been having experiences and sightings out there forever. Um, the editor of the Catalina Island newspaper told me he actually was able to write his own book on the sightings out there and the weird stuff. And he told me about a report and sighting that happened um, the same week in 1947 as Roswell and Kenneth, Ar Kenneth Arnold. And it, w it made the front page of the newspaper and he actually sent me a copy of it. And on the front page of the paper, uh, I forget the exact date, but it was the first week of July, 1947, um, two um, retired, and it was still army at the time, army pilots report uh, seeing three flying discs off the beach in Catalina Island. So, People report seeing those. They report see, there's reports uh, of people seeing like a, an anomalous, like illuminated green hovering door above Catalina Island. 
Um, I, yeah, I talked to one fisherman captain who uh, they were out on the boat. It was three in the morning, and the only people away were the captain and one of the deckhands who was in the kitchen at the time. And the deckhand, well, they both saw it. It was the entire inside of the ship lit up like daylight. And for like two seconds and the deckhand said to the captain, uh, sir, did you see that? And the captain said, yep. And it happens all the time. And it just went on. So, I mean, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Where the Nimitz was, was that was pretty close to Catalina, right? Wasn't that? In the yeah. Samaria? Yeah. It was yeah. Uh, Catalina Guadalupe. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, I'll just mention one more thing. Uh, another guy that I became friends with, he owns uh, the Shark Cage company out there. He's a, also, I believe he's a producer for Shark Week for Discovery Channel. Um, you know, they rent out all the cages for their great white, you know, diving experiences. Yeah. And uh, he's another one that personally has been looking into this himself. Um, I don't know if you anybody saw the, uh, the series Unidentified, but on one of them, they went out to Guadalupe and they talked to a marine biologist who was studying the great white sharks out there. And the guy that I met actually got that person out there. He's really involved with everything. And he is, I don't know if he got it, I'm waiting. Um, he has a, a video that he is getting or may, might have got of, um, I think it was a, a bright orange orb rising out of the water and taking off into the sky that another fisherman captain got. And unfortunately, these fishermen, they don't want to talk because it's the same stigma mm -hmm. as a pilot. You know, it's, yeah. it's like, you, you know, it's there, but if you talk about it, you're a loony, you know? Well, but that's what, that's what was making me think about is like, we usually always think about pilots, but all, all these people on these different boats and ships, I mean, they, they probably have just as much right. uh, stories and, and encounters. Yep, and they do, and they're afraid to talk about it. So hopefully that'll change. You know, and people like Preston Dennett, you know, have been studying this stuff for years, and kind of now it's all, you know, coming about. Preston uh, has reported about the Malibu anomaly out there that is allegedly a underwater base out, out in Malibu. Micah, what, uh, since we haven't talked in a while, your thoughts on what's going on in the UFO world now, man? I'd love to know. Sweet. Well, you know, there are, there are a lot of recent developments. I have to say right off the bat, you know, I really appreciate Brother Dave's historical approach because something that people completely seem to be missing about the current state of the phenomena is the fact that this is something that has been in our midst at very least for the last several decades, perhaps much longer than that. Now, you know, I've never really been an advocate of the whole ancient aliens idea. If anything, I've really been more antagonistic toward that because being someone who is an archaeological advocate and literally an avocationalist, I'm not a professional archaeologist, but, mm -hmm. you know, all of the archaeological phenomena that I observe, and by that I mean those things which remain unexplained historically speaking, you know, I think that there are human explanations for those things. I don't look at them as being evidence, you know, of extraterrestrials or anything else. And again, kind of coming back to what you were saying, you and Dave, you know, the ET hypothesis is only one explanation, potentially one interpretation of the UAP phenomena that we're observing. But again, you know, Dave looking at the history and helping to establish the fact that people in that area where this now famous 2004 USS Nimitz incident took place, you know, people establishing that there have been similar occurrences there at least going back a few decades. You know, that's about the time frame I'm comfortable working with. But as a historical researcher and looking at this kind of like Dave does, and actually, you know, behind the scenes, I've been working very in depth on a historical UFO project that looks further back, especially uh, looking at what I call the ufological dark ages that occur between the 1890s and the 1940s. There is quite clearly a tradition of people experiencing the process of seeing something in the sky they can't identify and then trying to reconcile with it. And they project any number of different ideas and attitudes onto that, you know, ascribe or assign agency to it. Gods, aliens, angels, demons, interdimensionals, metaterrestrials, ultra terrestrials, if you're a John Keel fan. So, you know, all of these different interpretations are layered onto it. And it has been for me personally, 
both learning to step back and say, well, we don't know, we can't know, we can acknowledge some kind of, or perhaps, you know, maybe more than one kind of phenomena, but we can't really go much further than that. So what we have to do, what is incumbent upon us at this point is to study it without biases. Now, Again, you know, an advisor to the project that Dave is, uh, you know, involved with, uh, Rich Hoffman, a friend of mine, also a colleague and fellow member of the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies, which I've recently joined the ranks of. Um, I've never joined a UFO group in my life, ladies and gents. I've never been a part of an organization. I've always preferred to be a free agent, but I'll tell you why I joined the SCU, because, you know, I do feel like right now it's so very incumbent upon us to be applying science to this phenomena. That's my approach. Uh, that is, in part, I think, what really needs to be done with this in addition to the historical and maybe also anthropological approaches. But, you know, that's what Dave and the guys, he mentioned Skyhub, their partners, and again, a, another great organization that is attempting to try and apply the best scientific and technological resources at our disposal right now toward this problem. I, I really am beginning to feel that it is incumbent upon us to, to try and understand what this is and to try and assess. Again, there doesn't seem to be any overt threat, but we need to assess that potential because it does represent, if this phenomena is technological and it appears to be, it seems to be a technology that is far beyond that which we know to exist on Earth, at least in terms of things of earthly provenance. So we must try to assess what the risk potentials are. That is only sensible. And so first and foremost, I'm glad that there are civilian groups that are looking at it. You know, I've spoken with Mr. Lou Elizondo on a couple of occasions uh, and at length off the record, of course. And I've come to know Lou to be a very uh, logical, a very um, well-prepared and also a very, frankly, just, I mean, a very uh, congenial person. He, he's a good guy. Uh, Lou Elizondo is somebody who is passionate about this subject and who essentially wants all the same things that we do. And so with the UAP task force and everything that's happening right now with government looking at it and trying to assess if government has any additional information that they can apply toward this, civilian investigators like myself, my colleagues, Timothy McMillan, uh, MJ Benias, and a few others, you know, taking the Freedom of Information Act request approach and trying to get information about it. You know, the picture that emerges, and this is all coming back to your fundamental question, what's going on with UFOs and what do you think about it? I do think we're getting to a point where we're probably no closer necessarily to identifying the unidentified, but we are to a point where we're seeing this kind of swelling of cultural interest that is going to propel us toward probably a new area of scientific inquiry with this. I think that's what Dave and the guys are doing. That's certainly what I know the SCU is trying to do. As an independent historical researcher, that's what I'm trying to do also is establish how long has this presence been in our midst and how can science best be applied toward trying to understand, if not what it is, at very least, what it means. Yeah, and kudos to you, Dave, for getting out there and doing it. And it's, it's, uh, once the, hopefully that COVID kind of passes, you can get out there more and you guys can really uh, start more investigating. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of disappointing that with all of the articles that came out and all of the groups and people on, online, UFO Twitter, you know, no, nobody ever really did any research to see the historical part of the encounter. You know, right. there's so many skeptics and debunkers about what the Tic Tac was it's it's surprising that nobody has really looked into you know is there a history of things happening out there you know it blows my mind yeah yeah you know to, to what dave's saying if i may just jump in very briefly sure. again this is a a sincere frustration you know i do actually have respect for some of the skeptics who have tried to offer explanations but i'll also respectfully disagree with for instance mick west Mick has said, you know, this could just be a distant aircraft. I say, if it's just a distant aircraft, why is it flying without a transponder on in controlled airspace? I'm sure Dave, I know Dave's thought about this because he and I have talked about it. You know, again, we have to account for all the phenomena. Now, that doesn't mean that there couldn't have been a drug runner, you know, flying out there in that controlled airspace without a transponder on and taking... That means the pilots are lying. <laughs> but that seems to mean that definitely doesn't jive with what the pilots have told right. us. And again, what Chad Underwood has, if you heard the recent interview that he did with Jeremy Corbell, you know, the, and I have to say it was actually a very good interview that they did. It was on YouTube. Jeremy put it up there. But, you know, Chad Underwood, I've known Jeremy for years. You know, I know people give him a hard time, but, you know, I mean, I, I applaud him for the hard work he does 
I think he's a, a beautiful filmmaker. He does, he does eye candy on the screen. So, but, but he also has done a fantastic job getting these pilots, you know, Dave Fravor, Chad Underwood, all these guys on the record. And Chad's sitting there talking to Corbell saying, look, under any other circumstances, what that aircraft was doing at that time in that airspace would have been recognized as an act of war. Now, I have to ask people, what part of act of war do you not understand, right? If, if, if this were a known presence, if this were a technology that could be easily attributable to any world power, China, Russia, U.S., otherwise, you know, this would be recognized as a real problem. And yet we want to say it's a peanut dangling on a piece of monofilament. I just don't buy that. Not based on the preponderance of the evidence to the contrary. So let's switch gears away from UFOs or UAP, whatever that uh, the terminology is these days. Let's switch gears over to Terry. And I guess we're going to talk about like some uh, interesting archaeological finds. Terry. T Terry, yes. Terry has some UFO stories. Does he? Yeah, as Does, well. well, we're going to, okay, well, maybe we'll get to those. Yeah. Well, I, I thought I was in trouble here because I don't know a lot about UFOs. <laughs> Terry, <laughs> tell me all about your UFOs. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, wow. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, Terry, tell us, uh, that's the kind of what we did with Dave, tell us a little bit about the Ancient Historical Research Foundation and what it is that you guys do. So, originally, the Ancient Historical Research Foundation was a was a nonprofit organization. We was a closed group. There was eight of us. Um, there was, we had scientists, some money backers, some uh, archeologists and, and people like that. And, and it was just to, to do research on and, and scientific study on things that was out of place archeology. span and, and along the way, you know, we, we dabbled into lost mines, buried treasures and things like that. Um, uh, Eventually, something happened to every one of us where we kind of had to break it apart, but we'd come back together and just kind of invited everybody, and it's just kind of a, just kind of a group where people bring to the table um, interesting things that they found or know about, and so because of that, you know, we, we hear quite a lot of interesting things. People bring things to us, so um, that's basically in a, it in a nutshell. So what's, uh, what, part of the, what part of the country is this primarily? that you that you look into so so anywhere anywhere in the in the in the country but i i'm out of utah and so that's basically where i do most of my stuff is in utah you know and i look i look at things like um you know giants uh the egyptians in the grand canyon um things things like that uh are we talking about like the the nephilim is that what you're talking about the, the nephilim yep okay okay I didn't. I wasn't the. I wasn't aware about the Egyptians in the Grand Canyon. Oh yeah. What uh, what time period are we talking here? So so, I don't know what time time period these were, but there was an article came out in the Phoenix Gazette in nineteen oh seven, nineteen oh nine, I think. Um, it's been you know back before the internet. It wasn't known about very widely, but now that the internet's there, it's it's known pretty pretty widely, but the Smithsonian went down through the Grand Canyon exploring and found this catac these catacombs that, that was this housed with uh, uh, ancient artifacts and ruins and things that were Egyptian or, or, or Oriental type um, artifacts. And then, and then since that thing, you know, that they, they've dismissed it and says, no, that was just sensationalized newspaper reporting. It didn't really happen. Well, that area, um, they they uh, um, they closed that area off. You can't go hiking in there. You can't go in there. You can't fly in there. They've they've given all the area around there names, and that's in the Grand Canyon. Well, just down from the the Grand Canyon um, is what is Lake Powell. That was part of the the Colorado River, and that's what Lake Powell was built out of was the Colorado River, and that goes through the Grand Canyon. Well, just down from there, a friend of mine found these Egyptian hieroglyphs down there, and in, in Lake Powell, the only way to get there is by boat. And so we've been trying to, to find these things so we can get a clear picture. We, it, the picture's clear enough to see that they're Egyptian, but it's not clear enough to, to read it and see, you know, if this is part of the, the Egyptians in the Grand Canyon that the, that the S -S Smithsonian supposedly found, or is this just, uh, you know, some college Egyptologist professor 
went down there and just wrote, you know, me and my family went camping here and had a great time, but it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty lengthy, big panel um, for that. So anyways, are there that any was, that was oh, sorry, that was gonna say that was uh, G E G E Kincaid. Right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any thoughts or theories about um, when the Egyptians would have come or would like, like how they would have gotten to, to Arizona? Uh, so, you know, the thought is, you know, I don't know what the thought is. You know, the thought is that, that uh, the, the waters was a lot higher. You know, you, you know that, uh, and I don't know what part of California, Baja, you know, they, the, the waters came up into there and then there was an earthquake and sealed it off and it dried up. But they figure they come up the waterways through the Colorado, through, through all that there. But, uh, you know, mainstream archaeologist says, you know, that doesn't happen. There wasn't internet, intercontinental travel. Um, and, and that could be true, but that's what I want to look and see. I want to find one of these, something like this, um, and see, is that true? You know, there's been artifacts found, you know, like in Pocatello, Idaho, there was an, 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 an egg-shaped rock. It was the size of a chicken egg, and it had markings on 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 it and, the, and it was found in 1918 by a young girl and they just thought it was uh made by the indians indian scratchings on it well this young girl when she kept it all her life and when she got older she got terminal cancer and her great granddaughter came to visit her so she gave this um chicken egg rock to her to her great granddaughter well that grand granddaughter kept it all of her life because it was something special that her great grandmother gave to her before she passed away and when the when king touch Tombs exhibits was coming through in the 70s. Um, the Smithsonian Magazine had a had an article on it, and she was in the dentist's office in California, flipping through this magazine and seeing the articles on King Tut's tomb. And she started noticing that there was markings on the sarcophagus. It was the same markings on this egg that her grandmother, great grandmother, gave her. So she took it to the University of Berkeley, and they authenticated that it was a piece of alabaster that came from Egypt and it had King Tut's high priest signature on one side of it and the cartouche of his name on the other. Now this was found in 1918. They never broke into King Tut's tomb until 1922. They didn't even know who he was until then. How yeah, did that artifact, after that, yeah. How did that artifact get there and how did they know if somebody frauded it, how did they know to do that? And there's been other Egyptian artifacts found. You know, there was a, there was a, a well, there's just been other artifacts found around, but it's always said, you know, that it's a fraud. It can't happen. It's, you know. But if they were frauds, what, what type of people would would be able to have the knowledge to create those frauds? One hundred percent. One hundred percent. There was there was an Egyptian scarab found uh, um, near Durango, Colorado, um, by a by a five year old boy in the in the ni in 1953, I think. And he kept it all his life, and he showed it to me um, probably four or five years ago. I, I tracked, I heard about it. I didn't know it was Egyptian scarab. I thought it was what I've been tracking down these these symbols that are scattered across the West, Western United States, neatly carved. I call them the mystery glyphs. I thought he'd found one of them. When I got to him, he showed me that Egyptian scarab. And I had some professionals look at it, some antiquities dealers, and a couple of them says it's 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 a fraud, it's a gibberish. But some other people come and says, no man, this is this is uh, you know the 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 writing that you is really nice and good is by the priests, and but the common people they don't write as good. They didn't do that, but this is some kind of a an amulet, a magician's amulet, and this looks real and good to me. You know, so so there's things out there. It's just when people find them and turn them into the archaeologist, or um, they they uh, you know they because of their credentials are on the line, they don't dare say, yeah, this is real or this isn't. You know, it's automatically a fraud. So, but I mean, there's got to be there's got to be some hoaxes out there and some frauds. And one hundred percent, it is a fraud. So it it is tough to determine what is real and what, what is yeah. not. Because we, right. we, we do have different uh, groups in the United States, uh, especially with like secret societies and things like that, with people who, who would know about Near Eastern religions and, and Hebrew alphabets and things like that. So there's got to be, you know, there is some precedence that there are a lot of people who 
came here who uh, would have that knowledge or some semblance of that knowledge for like, say the 19th century, early 20th century or something like that. Yeah. And you, and you got, you know, you got the, the revival, the Egyptian revivals thing that came right, through right. in the early Napoleon, 1900s yeah. where there was a lot of Egyptian artifacts made, not as frauds, but just because people thought they were cool back in the early 1900s. And a lot of that stuff was lost and, and a lot of that stuff was being found. And it drug me down a rabbit hole one time when I thought I was tracking down a, some old artifacts, these Egyptian belts that had been being found, you know, but it turned out that they were just made in the in the early 1900s. So yeah, it's, it's tough to decide what's real and what's not. It's a lot easier now that we have the internet back before the internet, when you had to do interlibrary loans and talk to people, it was tough to figure out what was real and what's not. And it still is tough, but. Michael, let's, uh, let's bring you in on this, man. Uh, what's uh, you, you've, you've heard this. What's a, uh, I know you do the seven ages research group, you know, you have that and you have the podcast about that, which, uh, it's mostly about archaeology and uh, other aspects of it. So what, what, what are you, some of your thoughts on this? Well, you know, I really appreciate uh, what Terry just said there about the fact that, you know, again, with the appreciation that many people have for other cultural groups and their manifestations of culture, you know, that it can be very difficult sometimes to discern between uh, you know, emulation versus the artifact, right? Uh, and and like he's talking about, a more recent discovery of a more recent provenance, but which looks like something much earlier. It definitely makes it complicated, especially when we're dealing with, with surface finds. You know, in, in traditional archaeology, if you at very least are able to, you know, rely on stratigraphy, that's how it was done back in the day. But of course, now with the advent, I mean, I say now, but I mean, it's been around for decades, radiocarbon dating, optically stimulated luminescence, of course, is a more recent procedure that allows, even in the absence of carbon that's datable, we can still get a rough idea or sometimes a very accurate idea for the age of a uh, early human site. So, I mean, there are a lot of ways that things can be discerned, but, you know, I look at this one of two of way, uh, two ways. And again, I'm open to the idea, I'm absolutely open to the idea of different cultures that were far more precocious in their both technological capabilities and also in their uh, tendency to want to get around, you know, to travel, than the current anthropological paradigm would allow for. Current anthropological thinking does not like the idea of, again, the term, and it's really been a dirty word for years, as Terry will know, hyperdiffusion. But I don't think we have to go that far, you know, to say that all the world cultures, there was a global, you know, culture, and it was a supercontinent Atlantis or whatnot, you know. And again, we, we could talk about Atlantis later, even though I'm, I'm not really of a mind to think that there was a Atlantis as Plato wrote about it. I mean, I have gone to the Azores because of my interest in the idea of, well, what was the root behind that idea? Mm -hmm. Is there any possibility that there is a grain of truth behind the, again, the dialogues that Plato wrote? He wasn't known as a historian. He was a philosopher, but nonetheless, is there not a grain of truth behind the idea worthy of looking at? We could get into that later, but again, coming back to what Terry's talking about there, you know, when we have, the idea of diffusion, which is so controversial in terms of the current paradigmic archaeological or anthropological thinking, I would simply say this. You know, at one point we were all taught in school that in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, but of course now we recognize that Leif Erikson was here before him. Right. There's a very good chance that the Chinese were here before that, or at least contemporaneous with that. And there were probably others too. You know, what took me to the Azores uh, before the COVID-19 thing hit last fall had been a very peculiar story uh, that had emerged by, uh, it was a gentleman by the name of Podolin, who in the, uh, the 1700s had talked about the discovery of Carthaginian coins on the island of Corvu uh, in the Azores. And the question, of course, would be, because these were washed out after a storm swept through the area, why would there be Carthaginian coins on the island of Corvu that apparently had been buried and they're discovered in the 1700s? How did those get there? Now, unfortunately, there are no hard 
evidences in support of Podolin's account, but nonetheless, that story has remained interesting. So I went to the Azores, uh, and I corresponded with a uh, scientist there who actually teaches with the University of the Azores, or Azores, as they say there in the Portuguese. And he has found what he believes are petroglyphs, rock carvings, on some of the islands in the Azores that he believes correlate with the Bronze Age. Now, again, that's not, you know, 9,000, the sum of the years since the battle that was waged between those who dwelt beyond the pillars of Heracles, you know, and the Athenians, but it certainly is at least suggestive of the idea that maybe someone had known about the Azores, and to have gotten out there and to have carried Carthaginian coins, they would have had to have sailed and carried these material goods with them. Now, uh, we can also look at the historical record, and we see that, you know, on the eve of the cusp of the Age of Discovery, you know, the, I think it was Ferdinand, if, if memory serves, who's saying, you know, not go out there and see what you find. He's saying, go and find the islands. Again, the historical record seems to suggest that the Portuguese were well aware of the idea that there were islands in the Atlantic that could be found. Then we look at the existing traditions. Yes, Plato and Atlantis, but there were many others, the Fortunate Isles, you know, St. Brennan's Isle, you know, Ultima Thule. I mean, all these different concepts. And again, they all cannot be equated as being one and the same, but they are certainly suggestive of the concept, if nothing else, that there is a land, if you guys sail far enough, that you will find out there. I don't think it's hard to suppose that, again, yeah, probably prior to the age of discovery, Portuguese or other sailors went out there and they actually found the Azores. And then there are the more tantalizing, although equally unprovable accounts of Phoenician coins and things turning up off the coast of Brazil. So maybe there were people getting around in the old days. That doesn't necessarily have to, nece I mean, again, you know, the, the, the problem, I guess, is that people don't like this idea of hyperdiffusion. You know, that all these cultures, the Egyptians were sharing their information with the Aztecs and the Mayans and, you know, whatnot. It doesn't have to be that. It could just be that there were some very limited failed migrations where people went places and either turned around and went back after stepping foot on land, getting some water, and they're like, okay, let's just go back before we get in too deep. Or other things may have happened. You know, but for some reason, that idea seems very controversial. And I think Terry would appreciate the fact that I've got many friends in archaeology, cautious though I am when I'm discussing this stuff. Okay. <laughs> but, but I've got lots of friends who are traditional archaeologists who would say, I don't see why these are such controversial ideas. But again, if we're to evoke the idea of Thomas Kuhn, you know, the ebb and the flow of scientific revolutions and what it actually takes to bring down an existing paradigm with the accumulation of evidence to the contrary. I mean, it takes, you know, usually several generations and a whole lot of hard work. And even when the evidence is right there in front of you, sometimes people aren't necessarily accepting of it. So it's definitely challenging. We have to proceed with caution. Again, that's why I say I appreciate Terry, you know, recognizing that, hey, you know, just because you find something that looks Egyptian in America doesn't necessarily mean it is. But I also, on the other side of that debate, don't understand why there is necessarily so much aversion to the idea that people in the ancient world were quite sophisticated, quite capable, and maybe some of them were very well capable of getting around. But, you know, we have this tre tremendous aversion to the idea of the use of watercraft. They couldn't have, they didn't, they shouldn't have. You know, this would cause us to have to rewrite the history books. Maybe it's time to rewrite those history books. Who knows? Yeah, I think I a, a lot you. of it just comes from the, uh, you know, from history and, and some of the excesses of the antiquarians. And I think that has just made archaeology being a young science uh, feel like it has to defend itself so much and contrast itself to some of the past that it is very, uh, it becomes very conservative in its own way. Yes, many of the sciences end up being that way. And I understand why I respect that too. And, you know, I heard Terry saying he agreed, you know, and I think we both coming at this, um, and Terry, I don't want to speak for you. I, I presume probably you're, you're kind of in the avocationalist camp too, a, a dedicated amateur when it comes to archaeology. Am I correct? That's, that's right. I'm a Likewise. dedicated uh, <laughs> That's Likewise. Right. I don't profess to be a professional, although, again, rather than just getting out there and writing books, you know, about, you know, crazy theories and things, I mean, what I have tried to do is volunteer on actual dig sites, learn from actual archaeologists, you know, spend time learning about the process of archaeology from real archaeologists. And I can tell you, I've worked with some of the best, you know, 
again, sweating as I dug at their sites and everything. And then, of course, hope to be able to have a beer and some conversation after the fact. And they've been more than gracious in doing it. But often what I find is they are as interested in all of these same questions as any of us are. Yeah. Well, yeah. 100% they are. But, you know, I had an archaeologist tell me, tell me that if he found something that, did, that went against uh, mainstream archaeology, he he would he would bury it back up and never say a word because as soon as you find something, you put your name to something like that, you're criticized, you're ostracized. You know, and that's the same thing that happened with that lady that found the cocaine in the Egyptian mummies, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, Terry, if I may ask, why do, you, why do you feel like he was saying that? Because I guess we could interpret that one of two ways, right? Either he's saying, well, I know what would happen to me, therefore I won't talk about it. Or is he saying, I won't talk about it because that is in the furtherance of a paradigmic change? Oh, yeah. I think he's afraid of all of the above, you know, but 100% that they would, they would, uh, they would be ostracized. And, and that does happen in, in the academic world, in the scientific world, in all that. I had a friend that was ostracized just because he he did the studies, the scientific studies on the World Trade Seven, you know, saying that it was, you know, it was a controlled demolition, not just coming down. And uh, they ostracized him. They ruined his career. That was it, you know, because he went against what what they wanted him to say. Yeah. I mean, it happens in all areas of science. Uh, you know, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm recognizing what you're saying. I'm not, you know, endorsing any theory these days god you know how it is god forbid somebody actually endorse this theory or that but i mean we have to recognize that there's a cultural aspect to this isn't there where people yeah. even if they were to find evidence to the contrary of what they have been taught they may be disinclined to advocate that or to share that or to work in the furtherance of those discoveries for fear of what might result well and, and not only that it's it's that also that there is not a lot of this evidence is out there and when they and when that does come a lot of it is a fraud you know and so um to 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 find something that's real and to go with it you know that's that's not an easy thing to do and why would you want to waste your time on something that you've been taught you've been trained that it never happened so it's automatically in a fraud in your mind why would you even waste your time on it right and while there's overlap, and uh, something I always like to stress is that the the search for the mother civilization and things like that, it's really a, it's more than anything a spiritual quest. And I know it can use scientific uh, means and archaeological means, but I think that's something that a lot of archaeologists, um, people in the archaeological establishment don't um, don't really acknowledge as much as they is what might help them kind of understand, uh, you know, people who are looking for deeper answers and, uh, you know, I think it's a, it's a bigger quest than just scientific and archeological people are looking for the, um, what makes humans different, where we come from, why we have, uh, the abilities that we have, you know, I think it's just a, it's, it's kind of like a, a spiritual quest. You know, there's something to be said for that. There really is. I mean, I have a spiritual side. I just don't tend to commingle that, I guess, with, you know, my more scientific leanings. But, I mean, who doesn't go out on a beautiful day, especially, you know, here, almost coinciding with the autumnal equinox, you know, who doesn't go out on a beautiful day and just go out there and just take in nature and just feel like, you know, maybe there's something else. Maybe there's something more. Is it really wrong to feel like there's something more is it really wrong to think that humans aren't the be all end all last word? I think that we need that sense, however real or not it may be, that there might be something more than us. I'd think it was a terribly bleak universe if we were the last word, wouldn't you guys think? <laughs> yes, sir. Sp speaking Absolutely. of that, uh, Terry was uh, once asked to go to Mexico to look at some possible alien type artifacts. You want to tell him about that, Terry? Yes, please do. <laughs> they've been they've so, been waiting so i am not a ufo guy um i don't study it i mean it's not that i'm not interested in it. I, i'm just interested in other things but it comes across my desk every now and again and, and i had some uh people show me some artifacts that looked like they was they was uh yo know, alien and and the story i got was that that a guy i knew 
took some ground penetrating radar down there to Mexico. I'm not sure. I knew where it was at one time, the area, but I, I don't remember now. Anyways, uh, they, they found a mound. They said there was something there, so they dug into it. The story I got was they dug up a UFO, and not only just the UFO, but there was a, there was a, the pilot was in it. And so that excited me. If it's real, if it's real, if it's giants, if it's out-of-place archaeology, if it's a UFO, I want to see it for myself. So I was going to. I'd want to see that too, Terry. I, I, I don't blame you on that. I'd love to see a mummified <laughs> alien pilot. That would be awesome. So, so I was, I was headed down there, or I was going to head down there, but I needed an archaeologist because I wanted somebody. I wanted this to be, you know, scientifically. I wanted the, you know, so it's tough to find an archaeologist that'll deal with with UFOs, you know. Uh, 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 come on, what archaeologist <laughs> wouldn't want to go see an alien pilot? <laughs> Yeah, but, but, but I did find one, you know, I, L.A. Marzulli, he, you know, he put me in contact with one, so I was going to Reno to, to meet him, and, and on the way there, I, you know, I, we couldn't talk to these people in Mexico except for on, you know, the, uh, the, the scrambled signal, signal communications, and, and, uh, yeah, they were really hush-hush. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, okay. it, it, it was, it was, uh, um, they 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 didn't speak very good English, and I didn't speak any Spanish. And the people I was with spoke a little bit. And so while I'm traveling down there, you know, we call them, and and I'm starting to get a different story than than really what I was told in the first place. On my way to meet the archaeologist in Reno, I was going to meet him in Reno and and fill him in because we didn't want to talk on the phone on this. It was going to be a hush, hush, hush. We was going to try and bring the spaceship back. All that. I mean, it was, <laughs> Were you going to try big... to put it in like the back of a flatbed or something? <laughs> yeah. Give it a jump start. But it, it would have been a it would have been a UFO full of cocaine. <laughs> I thought, How are you do this. Anyways, as I'm going down there, the story starts changing, and then all of a sudden it comes back to. Well, we found some Mayan artifacts, and we need an archaeolog archaeologist down here to, to verify that, that they are mine and, and authentic so we can sell them on the black market and get more money. And as soon as they said that, man, that was it. I was out of there. I called off the meeting, and that was it. So that's as far as that went. <laughs> wow. That's something else. Huh. Well, that's terribly unfortunate. I mean, you know. I, I would have loved to see a fine saucer. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, so, so they did say that it wasn't this group that found the flying saucer. It was another group that they knew, and they claimed that they had the flying saucer. They had already dug it up. It was in a warehouse. But the story's changed so much that I just didn't want to didn't want to waste yeah. my time on it. Sounds so, like a, Terry, I'm glad quite a few I'm glad, middlemen going on. I, I've got to say, I'm glad Terry got out of that too, because you know, the minute they they say that they are selling anything on the black market, you know, you politely reply, "Well, then, looter, you guys yeah. go." You know, I mean, it's it's terrible that people think that it's okay to take the cultural. I agree. Right. You know, again, now, now on the same token, I also have no problem with a, you know, in, in accordance with the law in various states, because it's different from state to state. Terry will know this. But I mean, if a person is out looking for, for instance, arrowheads, you know, surface finds. Yeah. You know, or if you are assisting. Pottery on shards. Sense. Yeah, you know, I have no problem with, with that. Some states, I think, are actually draconian with their laws in the sense that they have tried to make it such that even if a person on their own property finds a surface find of archaeological significance, it's still against the law to actually pick it up. I think that's absurd because the way I see it is without the avocationalist who's willing to get out there and actually find these things, certain discoveries will not even be known to archaeologists. Yeah, so yeah. you need a little of both. But yeah, this whole idea of, yeah, let's sell this and, and questionable stuff at that on the black market, that's just deplorable. The best that is deplorable. And that's kind of a, that's kind of a problem I'm having with, a, with a, a thing that I'm looking for. It's called Brewer's Cave. It was found in the 50s by a man, um, these uh, two giants. Uh, the man was eight foot nine. The woman was seven foot eight. The woman was blonde hair. The man was red hair. Um, this man in the 50s found him. He dug in a cave. He was looking for arrowheads. He found these steps. He started digging down the steps. He got down into a tomb. It opened up into a tomb. He spent 10 years excavating this place off and on after work at night. And, and eventually he found these two stone sarcophaguses 
and he they was so heavy to get the lid off he took a handy mac jack in there jacked the hand the the lid off and there was these two mummies um wearing breastplates gold crowns the man had a sword bigger than he could he could pick it up um there was records in there written on gold and 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 uh it reminds me of like a scene out of like conan the barbarian or something <laughs> So, so when I when I heard this story, I thought, well, this is a this is a fraud because I accidentally stumbled onto these records that wasn't known to the public, and so when I heard this, I thought it was fraud, but it was interesting to me. So I went and tracked down everybody that was involved in this, and I found there was a stone box that came out of this, and it was hollowed out, and it had these um, copper plates in it, records with writings, old writings on them, and this this. Uh, uh, box was wrapped in cedar bark and then smeared with mud or smeared with pine peat pitch to waterproof it and then smeared with mud so it looked like a dirt clod. Well, I tracked down. This was brought out and I tracked it down and uh, had had it carbon dated. And when they carbon dated it, it dated at 2500 BC. And they they did not believe it. The clay people that did the carbon dating they did not. First they thought the artifacts was a fraud. And second, they, they couldn't believe that it would date to 2500 BC. So they ran the test 10 different times, 10 different times. It came out 2500 BC. And uh, they started, they was doing some carbon dating on some other artifacts at the same time. And they was coming back a lot older than they thought they should. So they got checking into and they used a different solution than what their, their machine was calibrated to. So they uh -huh. had to recalibrate it. When they recalibrated it, it came back to between 50 and 350 BC. But the interesting thing to me was they ran the test 10 different times. So when I got that report back, I knew that there was something to this. So I went looking for this place and I think I found it. But my problem is just what you said, um, Mike, is that you can't just go dig anywhere. You know, it's not my intentions to loot this thing. I want to, and, and nobody, no credible, Archaeologists will take me serious to, 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 to do this, you know, but I, I even went so far as to contact a lawyer in, in uh, Arizona, and we contacted one of the, the lawyers in Utah who helped draft the antiquities laws for Utah, and, and my lawyer did the talking, and without saying where we was at, what we was doing, or anything like that, he told me I just well sell drugs because I'm going to go to prison <laughs> just the same, and I don't want to go to prison. You know, I think I know where this thing is. I've been trying to figure out ways, but I don't want to say enough where somebody's going to come around yeah. and cut me out of it, so I can't see it. I just want to see it. I don't want to lose. Can it. I can I ask if it. it's I want to share it with the public? I want yeah. everybody to see this. I want real archaeologists in there to see that this is real. You know, Terry, if this is real. Terry, can I ask if it's public or private land? It's public land. Oh. If it was private land, I wouldn't have any problems at all. The, the, In fact, it's worse than public America, land. It's America on a secrets. section of property that I can't even file any mining claims on it. I can't dig. I can't do nothing. Wow. That's some uh, interesting information. I, um, you know, where, where to kind of go from here? I mean, this is... Terry, uh, Terry I want to ask you... Wait, wait, wait. I, wait, I, I have one thing to ask. One thing. Yeah, um, sure. Terry, I didn't get a chance to watch, but I saw that on your uh, YouTube channel, you had something about um, a woman in Skinwalker Ranch. What was that about? Oh, it was, it was just... Uh, it, it wasn't a lot. It was just back in uh, the... Two th early 2000s, I, I interviewed this lady. I, I, I was interviewing him. I was looking for, what I was looking for was that there was supposed to be a, a carving of a name of, of, of uh, oh, I can't remember his name now. And something De Leon, uh, 1669. And that was interesting to me because, you know, they said the Spaniards never came in here until, um, um, Escalante came in here, you know, and 1669 was way earlier than that. And so I was talking to her to see if she knew anything about it. And she just happened to ask me, this is in, I think, 2004, if I'd heard of Skinwalker Ranch. Well, I'd heard of it, but I really didn't know much about it. And she began to tell me that that uh, she was told, and she didn't say this on type, but she told me is that the Indians told her 
because uh, she lived out there on the, near the Indian Reservation. And she was friends with them. They told her that it was passed down to them that 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 the natives there was helping um, aliens get uh, platinum out of that area for their spaceships. So, anyways, that's basically what that wow. is. <laughs> so, I mean, Terry, when you hear something like that, you know. What do you think personally? I mean, do you think that there's something to that or are you just kind of like more in the investigatory mode and you want to just go find out? You don't like, I mean, I, you, I don't, don't, you don't pass any judgment on these these claims, right? I don't, I don't pass any judgment. You know, I keep an open mind. I, I don't necessarily believe them, but I keep an open mind because I hear enough things that eventually if I hear something else later on down the road that ties together, then it, then it makes me want to go research it and study it more, you know? Um, so I've got an open mind. I'm a, I'm a huge skeptic, but I have an open mind. Okay. I mean, why would in like maybe some hoaxes that you've found before, some things that seem like they may not be real, what motivation would someone have to to make one of these hoaxes? Uh, Besides notoriety, just trying to make a, you know. There's, there's okay. those. There's one person here that uh, um, he he's out and out done some frauds. It's it's got so bad that he wrote. You know, I, I here, here's here's one example. You know, this this guy he he. I don't know how far I want to get into this. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> It, it, because it because it indirectly and directly involved me and and so you know I'm biased to what I'm saying and that's why I tracked this stuff down on him. But he he claimed that he'd found some ancient records. Um, he had two witnesses with him. They you know went this ancient wall and took their metal detector there. It went off and and they pull these lead plates with writings on them. They man this is cool. And these guys the witnesses they wanted to you know they wanted to do the the uh, um, research on it. Well, this guy um, who who put these there, or claims you know that they was found there, he showed me pictures of these um, years before they were found. So I knew one hundred percent they were a fraud. You know, they 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 were. Um, anyways, uh, okay. So 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 he he this guy. Um, he, these guys are pressuring him, you know, we got to do research. Well, he knows it's a fraud because he, he, you know, he made them himself. But he, so now he starts fabricating letters from, from uh, scholars from saying, oh, yeah, this is a marvelous thing you found. You, you know, this is great. Keep up the research. And he's passing mm -hmm. to the people who are with him that, you know, he led to where they could find these. And, and I'm thinking, I know these are a fraud. Why is this scholar saying that, this, you know? So I, con I try to contact him and I find out that he'd been dead for 10 years. Oh, he'd already been dead for 10 years. So I contacted his son and says, you know, supposedly your dad wrote this. And he says, this thing is clear, completely full of gram grammatical errors. You know, my mother was a, a professional secretary. She did all his writing and proofreading. And man, no way would this pass her. And the, she did, they didn't even sign his name right. Anyways, the whole thing was a fraud. But the reason he frauded all this stuff was for notoriety. He wanted attention. He wanted to sell books. He wanted to, you know, and that, so that does happen. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I would admit that like notoriety is a big thing, right? I mean, you know, all of us here, we've probably been involved with people that are looking for notoriety, you know, whether that's on any kind of medium or, or whatever, they're looking for that kind of like quick buck with this stuff. But is there also a possibility of people making these hoaxes for some kind of greater purpose to them? In other words, kind of um, maybe a particular worldview or a particular mythology tried to make that Religion. make these things fit? Uh, man, we know that from that uh, that archaeologist that that. that found that what was it the link between the ape and the human or what what was the name of that i can't remember are you talking now. about the piltdown man yeah is that what yeah. it is yeah you yeah, know the piltdown that was a, man that yeah turned out to be a fraud and it was just to make a link just like you said to to create you know their theory was right and just like why they cover up the giants because they're afraid of religion you know back backlash well 
Oh, what I'm kind of where I'm kind of going with that is not necessarily just like you know a scientific worldview. I mean, you could say that there's some amount of it that you know could like be like a religion, but like religion in and of itself, are you trying to kind of would these people kind of are they trying to make things backdated to fit? Do you think that that yeah. could be a possibility? Oh, I think 100 percent that's possible. Yeah, okay. a perfect example of that here and I where I live in Utah is pre predominantly Mormon, and the, you know they have the the views that they're you know that that a group of people came over from the old world to the new world and yeah. and all that you know and so uh, there have been some people that that would make things to fit that to make that absolutely they would make that work, but but at the same time. You know, the Mormons, anytime they heard wind of anything that had to do with something that they thought would tie in with yeah, their religion, yeah. they, they was on it. They was tracking yeah. it down. They was, and they got records. And that's some of the records that I got into that I shouldn't have gotten into, yeah. you know, because they wanted to help to prove, you know, their religion was right. So they was going and tracking this stuff down. Cool. And people yeah. say, well, that's like just the, the Mormons. They made that up to, you know, but some of this stuff was real. And, and just because the Mormons found it doesn't mean that they made it, you know? Yeah. Well, we didn't want to be too specific. And I'm, I'm glad you put it out there because I wasn't sure with you being in Utah and everything. I didn't want to disparage the Mormons necessarily, but um, I totally understand. Uh, some of my family is from a, a Mormon sect and, and my parents remember um, growing up hearing about people going on these archaeological expeditions to basically try to try to prove the contents of the Book of Mormon. So yeah, Same that's something that happened we in World at. War II. Yeah. And the of course there's there's a lot of people speculate that that there's a, been a lot of Freemasons in America trying to um, build Atlantean myths and and connections to Knights Templar and things like that. Yeah, so it's so, not just the Mormons. Yeah, yeah you we, had we've got a lot of the Roman Crucians that was yep. you know into the Egyptian stuffs and and and, and any time any archaeological thing that is found that's that kind of looks like it could tip that way, Egyptians, you know. Uh, they say, oh, this was done by the Rosicrucians. This was done by the Knight or by the Masons. This was done by the Mormons. And, right, and that's right. it. That's in it. They won't study it. They won't see if it's real or not. You know? Micah, you've been silent. I'd like to get your thoughts on all this. Well, I'm here. You know, I recently spoke with Dr. Bettina Arnold, uh, who is the author of a paper, uh, The Past as Propaganda. That was written back in the 1990s, but again, the, the main thrust of her work looks at the way that National Socialist archaeology sought to steer a certain ideological perspective by trying to find certain and trying to present, more importantly, certain archaeological finds in the furtherance of that ideology. I think that's what Dave's been kind of alluding to right there. Yeah. You know, yeah, this is something that is absolutely an occurrence. And actually, you know, another corollary is in America, if we, if we look back prior to the formation of the Smithsonian Institute, and I, I know that they get a you know, bad rap, uh, you know, according to some of the alternative historians, because they see the Smithsonian's as, you know, having been complicit with the suppression of certain information. You know, we could actually look at guys like Elias Herdlichka. He absolutely was of a mind back in the 1930s that there were there was very little evidence of Ice Age man in the Americas. He didn't think that there was any evidence for a human presence in America prior to maybe 3,000 years ago, if that. Wow. And so his whole contention had been, look, we've got to try and now show that there is a distinctive continuity between the morphological characteristics of all the different human remains that we find in America that shows that there couldn't have been a much longer history of people arriving in the New World. And so, you know, this is an often cited example. You see Herd Lichka's work, uh, name come up in a lot of fringe literature, but you also see his name come up in a lot of the writings of career academic archaeologists who recognize the problem that Herd Lichka had a pet theory, and he was trying to make all of his discoveries mm -hmm. conform to that. Now, also, even going further back, you know, you have this kind of this famous feud that occurs between the actual newly formed Smithsonian Institute and the Davenport Society, the Davenport Society being essentially an earlier predecessor to the antiquarians, really, but they were a predecessor to the Smithsonian. And they absolutely did have members of that group who were proponents that the mound building cultures could not have been indigenous American, that they right, had right. to have been 
you know, someone from someplace else. And so they were trying to, at times, plant artifacts. And this really makes it difficult because, yeah. you know, I would love to be someone who actually could say, having visited some of these tremendous sites, you know, in, in uh, early American prehistory, you know, the Grave Creek Mound and the like, you know, I would love to think that that Grave Creek tablet that was recovered there is a legitimate archaeological discovery, but the problem, and it may be, who knows? But the problem is, is that we know that there were certain antiquarians who, like Terry yes. was talking about, they were trying to further a certain ideological perspective, and they would probably not have been, and in fact, actually, it's been demonstrable in some cases. It can actually be shown that there were some discoveries that were planted, and they were hoaxes, and crude hoaxes at that. That's how we know that they were hoaxes, but in, it's clear that they were trying to shape the narrative right. of prehistory to match yeah. their own narrow ideology. We, me and Adam are very familiar of uh, that kind of stuff because the, who's considered the father of Tennessee history, John Haywood. Um, we, we actually went to his, his obelisk grave recently. Um, and uh, he, he definitely was very, um, very instrumental in creating, um, basically, really creating what is what was the southeastern identity, um, and even giving justification to Andrew Jackson for Indian removal, and all those kind of things. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah and it's it's absolutely tragic, in in a lot of ways, especially when we get onto that side of the subject. You know, um, the Seven Ages guys and I, we did a two part series that borrowed. Uh, the name American Holocaust from the book yeah, of the same title, you know, looking at uh, the way that indigenous Americans have suffered as a result of a lot of, uh, you know, this goes beyond just, you know, the, the arrival of the Europeans. Actually, you know, I, I recently spoke to Dr. Robert Carballo of Boston University, and he's got a new book all about, you know, Cortez arriving and speaking, you know, first, and then eventually warring with uh, Moctezuma the second. And I mean, it is incredible, but the way that that defined the course that history would take for centuries, mm -hmm. my God, it was incredible. I mean, the, the tremendous effect of what was felt at that time. So, I mean, you know, this is why it's, and again, I know that Terry would agree, you know, and, and Dave, everybody here, we have to understand history. We have to be willing to ask hard questions about history sometimes. We also have to be willing to temper our own attitudes about it and make sure that we aren't getting beholden to those sorts of pet theories, especially since history shows that some, and again, Herdlichka, he was the leading anthropologist, I mean, of his yeah. day in America. But, you know, expert though he was, we can look back and we can see quite clearly that his ideology was flawed and it was based on a misunderstanding of the available evidence and also him giving himself to, uh, you know, buying his own hype, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, he was convinced that his own theories were correct and therefore all the evidence he found would be made to fit those theories, even if it right. didn't. And look, that could have set us back in terms of anthropological knowledge by decades, maybe more than that. Yeah. You know, and there are still some vestiges of that that remain in terms of questions we have about the archeology span of that era which maybe yet again right, would, right. Would, would benefit from a revisiting. We should maybe go back with a new fresh set of eyes and look at the determinations of, and again, not throw out the baby with the proverbial bath water, but at least ask some questions. If we really want to move science forward, sometimes it actually requires taking a couple of steps back and going, yeah. okay, where were we and how do we proceed more cautiously, more sensitively, and frankly, more intelligently from here? Yeah. And, and I mean, to be really personal, my personal perspective uh, makes me really sensitive to the Native American issues uh, because the influence that Native Americans had on my life growing up in Arizona. But then at the same time, uh, influence from interactions with those Native Americans and the mythology and understanding the sense of place was a interest in the further antiquity of those civilizations and and the world and the, their mythologies and everything. So you, you can't, you don't have to be, you know, one, one or the other, like they can both inform each other. Certainly. You know, I'll bring up something really um, controversial here. You know, there's this idea of the Salutrian hypothesis. This is a terribly right. controversial idea. You're not supposed to bring it up, not supposed to talk about it. And part of the reason is, is because when it was initially introduced decades ago, 
uh, you know, there had been white nationalist groups that essentially gravitated toward this, and they saw this as, just like what we're talking about, a vehicle for the furtherance of their own warped ideological viewpoints, right. which inherently were wrong. But then decades later, we had some very qualified scientists, Dennis Stanford, the late Dennis Stanford, we, we lost him, you know, but he, uh, with the Smithsonian Institute, uh, David um, Bradley, who had, uh, or I'm sorry, Michael Bradley, his uh, co-author, uh, they wrote a fantastic book called Across Atlantic Ice, which revisited, I'm sorry, I, I messed his name up tr twice. Let me try this again. Bruce Bradley. <laughs> so, so Dennis Stanford and Bruce Bradley, they revisit the idea uh, and they write a book. And again, they're not trying to conform to any ideological perspective. They are saying, look, the archaeological evidence that we have viewed is strongly suggestive that Salutrian hunters came across the Atlantic uh, in the midst of the Pleistocene, well in advance of the expected or accepted timeline for human arrival in North America. We aren't saying that they necessarily, well, that, you know, again, they may be open to that idea, but again, I would maintain that the evidence does not necessarily suggest if Salutrians were here, that they dispersed throughout North America, simply right. that they Especially came that genetic far. evidence, yeah. Again, well, based on the genetic evidence, there's very little evidence, but there is some. And, you know, Stanford and Bradley talked about that with regard to the haplogroup. Um, there is an anomalous or a missing sort of haplogroup, but that's also disputed by, uh, you know, other scientists. So even if we leave that off the table, I don't think it's all that far out to say, what if Salutrian hunters had actually made it to the northeastern North American continent and hunted there 20,000, 21,000 years ago? That doesn't seem that strange to me, but because it's like guilt by association, because yeah. the original yeah. idea as conceived was associated with fringe ideological groups. I know many, I mean, great archaeologists who won't touch that with a 10 foot pole. So naturally my guys and I, we have Dr. Bradley, Dr. Bruce Bradley comes on the show. We talk with him. Yeah. And the reason we talked with him is because this guy is incredibly well-respected by all of his colleagues. Nobody disputes that. They only dispute the whole Salutrian hypothesis, and it's pretty clear why. They seem to associate it with that old, outmoded conception of the idea, and so we right. had him on the show. I asked him point blank, Dr. Bradley, I mean, would you say that you are an expert on the Paleolithic cultures and the artifacts left by these cultures in Europe? And he said, yeah, absolutely. I said, if you saw one of these artifacts, do you think you could identify it? And he said, unequivocally, yeah. Okay, well, let's talk about what's been found off the northeastern coast. And I mean, naturally, one can sense he's a bit defensive talking about it because he has been attacked so much. Right. Dr. Bradley's sitting there. This is one of the most, I'm, I'm going to tell you honestly. I mean, I'm a layman, but I've spoken with a lot of archaeologists over the years, and he is the most qualified to talk about that subject. And yet he's the one saying, look, this is what the evidence shows. And I, I, not only do I fail to see how it's all that archaeologically, um, um, you know, I, I don't see how it's so controversial an idea. I also am just kind of amazed that his colleagues are so willing not to hear him out. And none, none have had him on a podcast. He's quoted all the time, but never do you see an interview with him talking about it. So we had him on the show to talk about it, you know, and I still maintain, you know, hey, I would need to see a little more evidence, but the theory the hypothesis is not crazy, but this is what happens to someone who steps out of bounds and says, you know what, I may be a well-respected archaeologist, but hey, you know what, I'm going to speak my truth and tell you what I have found, you know, knowing what the implications of that may be. So I've witnessed that firsthand, and I've got to applaud archaeologists like Dr. Bradley, the late Dr. Uh, Dennis Stanford of the Smithsonian, who went to the grave, you know, amidst controversy and turmoil associated with this theory that he has reintroduced, but again, in a very different way from the way that it had been produced and accepted by certain groups decades ago. We've got to make that differentiation. We've got to make that clear distinction. The idea in itself, based on the merit of the archaeological mm -hmm. evidence, is not crazy. But when are we going to allow science, okay, to actually take precedence over ideology. That's the question. If we're really going to be advocates of science, we need to look at where the data leads us, don't we? And even some Man, of the, like, the, way, the way that some of us approach some of this more fringy stuff now would be like, 
I would think that searching for a mother civilization or an idea like that would actually be, you know, nowadays it's more about the, like a universal brotherhood of mankind and not necessarily some, you know, old ideology that people were trying to push in the 19th century. Terry, what were you going to say? I was just going to say, Micah, man, I like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, likewise, brother. That, that's exactly what I figured you guys would have uh, some good stuff to talk about. Well, hey, I, I, Micah, I got you. You're probably a busy guy, but I, I interviewed a guy. I got a small YouTube channel. If you look, uh, if you search on YouTube, Terry Carter Treasure Hunter, and look up, if you've got the time, history changing ancient artifacts found in North America. This was a guy that, that uh, was friends with, a, with some people that found these artifacts in Colorado. Um, man, if you get a minute, look at that and just see these artifacts that are being shown and tell me what you think about well, them. Well, I certainly I'll, will. I'll talk he's, to got a, he's got a lot of cool videos. Uh, I just I'll, saw the I'll one with the I'll talk to you later about head. that, Mike. I'd just like to know your opinion and, and, uh, on, on these. Of course. No, I would be delighted. I would love to. And, and Terry, and you're welcome to just to reach out to me too, but I'll, I'll definitely check those out and, and, and have a look at them. I will. Thank you. Yeah, hey man. Terry, I wanted to I wanted to ask you about about treasure hunting. I mean, it's something that really captivated me as a as a kid growing up in the in the Phoenix area, and we used to go to the Superstition Mountains all the time. And so the the Lost Dutchman's mind mythology really got you know implanted on me really early. But uh, what's the what what's kind of that that uh, relationship between treasure hunting and then some of these other interests you have? It's just the same thing. More than anything, this is an excuse to get out and, and explore. Okay. You know, it's because I, I, that's what I like to do. But, but that's the same thing as, you know, searching for something that's out of place, you know, um, it, the, the chance or to find something that, that's been buried for hundreds of years that they say doesn't exist, you know, and like you say, the lost Dutchman, you know, there's a lot of people say the lost Dutchman is real and there's a lot to say it's, it's, it's not real, you know, and so it's just the, it's just the interesting to figure out the, the lore, is it real or is it yeah. not real? That adventurism and, and uh, you're kind of going out and doing like a, what they call legend tripping, I guess, and something like that. Like it's, it's really fun to get outdoors when you have some kind of cool uh, legend or something behind it. Yeah, it just makes it a better excuse, you know. <laughs> so, 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 so you're from that area. I got a ghost story. I don't know if you want to hear a ghost yeah, story. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, right on that area about that. Let's hear it. So, so. I have never had any ghost experiences, didn't know that I believed in ghosts, and, and, and so I was invited by uh, uh, Wayne Tunnel and his group down to the, the Lost Dutchman. They had a Dutch Hunter's Rendezvous, and Wayne, Wayne Tunnel and, and uh, Frank Augustine, they was on that show, the History Channel show, uh, Legends of the Superstition Mountain. So I was invited to come down to their little their thing down there, and so while I was there, you know, met all them guys, it was great, and, and uh, they, uh, I won some tickets to, the, to get in free to the Lost Dutchman Museum there. So I went in after this thing, I went into the Lost Dutchman Museum and, and, I, and I, I uh, went through it and I was leaving. Um, this older gentleman with a name tag on stopped me and asked me, you know, where I was from. And at the time, you know, I live in Utah, but at the time I was, I was working in Wyoming and I'd traveled there from Wyoming. And so I told him, well, I, I'm, I live in Utah, but I, I, I'm working in Wyoming, so I'm staying in Wyoming. And this guy tells me, oh, Wyoming. You know, he says, I used to work at all them power plants there. And I told him, yeah, that's what I was doing, was working at a power plant. So anyways, he says, what? I, so I, I'm thinking, well, if he's from Wyoming, he must be out here looking for the Lost Dutchman mine. If he's here at, and, and being one of these tour guides at the Lost Dutchman Museum, so I asked him, I says, well, what brings you out here? And I'm thinking, you know, if he's got a great story, I want to interview him and put him on my YouTube channel. I wished I'd interviewed him, but I didn't. Anyways, he starts telling me that he wasn't, he, he looked for the Lost Dutchman mine, but, but really he just loved history, loved getting out and exploring. And, you know, he, he worked there at the, the Lost Dutchman Museum, volunteered and, and, Anyway, so I had him tell me a story, and he tells me this story about how um, he heard that he was, there was these old Pioneer Coke ovens, and above the Coke ovens, there was a heart on the mountain. He figured that had to do something with the Lost Dutchman, uh, the Lost Dutchman mine. And, uh, he's, and so he found this guy named Salvador Delgadillo, 
um, to take him out there and show him these old ovens. Well, it just so happened, I just spent the weekend with Salvador Delgadillo. He was at this lost uh, Dutchman rendezvous. And so I knew who Salvador was. So he tells me that they go out there, they get clear out there, and then he tells me this big, long, in detail story of how coming out, he got a flat tire and then got another flat tire. So he's riding on the rims and, and they go up this, this uh, ravine and they get stuck. They have to dig out. And then they try again. They get stuck worse. They can't dig out. It's in the middle of July. It's hot. They don't have enough water. They got to hike down to a river. I mean, this big detailed story. And then how they got to hike out in the middle of the night when it's not, and they hiked all night long. And then finally early in the morning, they hear this sound and, and they climb up on this bluff and there's a road up there and a motor home and this older couple, they feed them breakfast and then take them town, get new tires. I mean, it was a great, interesting story, but not one I wanted to, to video. Anyways, I never thought anything more of it. About four months later, I went down and was, and was back down there in Apache Junction. I was talking to Salvador and, and, uh, I, and the reason I went down there is I got this uh, uh, email saying that they'd found this old Egyptian looking necklace along the Gila River. Um, and so I, uh, I, I was wanting to go down there and try and f track this guy down and see, find out more about this Egyptian looking necklace. Because they said they was on motorcycles. It was way back in nowhere. They, they happened to be spinning donuts and this, this necklace flipped out in the middle of nowhere, you know. So I, I uh, was talking to Salvador. I said, Salvador, have there been any Egyptian artifacts or anything that you know of that's been found around here? He says, yeah, there's a guy that found a cave that had some Egyptian and Oriental artifacts. And he says, um, I don't know exactly where it is, but he says, I know the general area. Come on, let's go. So we, he hops in my truck. We, we travel out there and we're in the middle of nowhere. And and, and all of a sudden he says, stop, stop, looky there. He says, see those, those are the, those are the Pioneer Coke ovens right there. And there's a heart on the mountain above there. And I thought, man, I just talked to, you know, four months earlier, I talked to this guy telling me this story, how he, Salvador took him out there and they got stuck. And I said, Salvador, I just talked to one of your friends, says how you came, brought him out here and how you got the three flat tires and and Salvador starts telling me the same story. I says, yeah, I just met him four months ago. And Salvador says, what do you mean you couldn't have? I says, yeah, I talked to him four months ago. He says, you couldn't have. That was old Jim Hatton. He's been dead for eight to 10 years. Whoa. And I, thought, there ain't, I thought, there ain't no way. I thought, you know, Salvador's wrong. And so I go over to uh, Goldfield Ghost Town. I'm talking to the owner, Bob Shoes, And I'm saying, Bob, did you know a guy named Jim Hat. Oh yeah, he says Terry, you'd have liked him because because he was uh, he was some kind of an engineer and he worked on them power plants over in Wyoming where you're working. You'd have <laughs> liked him. I says yeah, I just met him four months ago and he looks at me kind of funny. He says you couldn't have. He's been dead for eight to ten years. Now, this guy I talked to, he did not look dead. So I went back to the museum. I'm gonna find him. <laughs> and I go in there. Jim Hat, he around and there's. The, the, one of the guys there says, there's no Jim Hat here. I says, yeah, I talked to him about four months ago. He says, I've been here four years. I haven't ever heard of no Jim Hat. Let me go talk to one of the old timers here. So he goes back and talks to him and he says, oh yeah, Jim Hat, he used to be one of the you know main people here, but he passed away eight, ten, eight to 10 years ago. And I ain't kidding you. He did not look dead to me. He was talking did you to ever, me and there was other a picture people of him? walking around. I never got a picture. I wished I would have interviewed him. <laughs> you know, I, don't know people, I don't know if other people could see him or if they just seen me talking to myself and stayed away <laughs> from us. I have no idea. But, you know, he looked alive to me. So. That's crazy. That's great. Wow. That's quite the experience. I would, I would have, T Terry, you got to see if anybody has a picture of him so you could, you know. Yeah, yeah. There's got to be oh, some yeah, record of his him. employment. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I've seen pictures of him. Yeah, it was the same guy. Oh, yeah. no, Holy! You've actually yeah. compared your recollection to the photographs people showed yep. of. Wow. Huh. Yeah, well, Salvador says it couldn't have been. He must have. He must have told that story to somebody else, and they're reliving it. But this guy, you know, he told it in detail. You know? So I don't wow. know what to think of that because I, you know, I, I was kind of a disbeliever in ghosts. I've never seen a ghost, heard of a ghost, you know. Um, I don't know what to think now. He looked real to me. That's crazy. Man, that is uh that is that is a story. That, that's wild. Whoa. Crazy. Wow. Guys, uh this has been fascinating. Um 
thank you so much, Terry, for coming on. Has this been the first kind of podcast that you've done? Um, I've done a couple others, but not not very good. I'm a better listener than I am a talker. Okay. Well, we'd <laughs> like to listen to you some that. more. I think you got a you got a lot of stories. Yeah, we'd like I to agree. talk to you. In the oh future. yeah. I do have a lot of stories. It just takes me a while to remember them. <laughs> well, Terry, like, what's what's next for you, man? I mean, or like, what's the what's kind of like the next big adventure, the next big investigation? Uh, so I was just just uh, invited to a trip in Mexico to go look for a lost silver mine that that uh, that happens to be this uh, lawyer that I got from uh, in Arizona to help me contact the Utah lawyer on the antiquities law. He, his his grandfather found a, a, uh, a silver mine. He actually had an Indian show him that. So anyways, um, I'm trying to arrange so that this month we can head down there to Mexico and see if we can't locate that. So I'm always got all kinds of adventures going on. It just depends on, on, on what and when and, and how, and if I can get off work, I got to work so that I can, so I can pay for my plan. Yeah, that's true. We'd love to come out there sometime and uh, go on an adventure with you there, uh, Terry. That man, you come on out. All right. He, uh, he, Terry, I, I had just real quick. I had my my partner from Hollywood from my agency went out to visit Utah, or she was doing a convention out there, and she asked me, uh, you know, what she could do in her spare time, and I said, oh, let me give my friend Terry a call and Terry took her to go look at a bunch of cool petroglyphs and stuff. She had oh, a great nice. time. She had a, Terry was the tour guide and she had a blast. Nice. There's, there's a set of these, there's a set of these petroglyphs out there. In my opinion, are the, are the neatest in the United States. I mean, these things are Egyptian or Aztec looking, they're full bodied. They got jewelry. I mean, they're in detail. The one time they was colored, had colors along with the peck pecking out of them. And they're, man, they're just spectacular. Nice. Nice. Uh, Micah, what's, uh, What's next for you, brother? Oh, Terry, before we get to that, actually tell everybody where they can find your website and if they want to um, see have, and your YouTube channel. So um, I just have a small YouTube channel. It's uh, if you search on YouTube, Terry Carter, Treasure Hunter, and look for the pirate with the pat, the skull and crossbones with the patch on the eye. And then the Ancient Historical Research Foundation, my partner, um, he, he passed away about five years ago and he kept our websites up and I don't know how to do any of that but it's ancient historical research foundation.com. So. Okay. Perfect. And Micah, what's next for you, man? Like that's what's, what's on the agenda for Micah Hanks. Micah. Yeah. And what Dave said. Yeah. I'll be doing a podcast by the way. Uh, first and <laughs> foremost, it was great to be able to talk to you, Terry and uh, to meet you. Dave has said wonderful things about you and uh, it's been fantastic uh, getting to talk and yeah, I um you know I'm working on a book about relict hominoids right now. So, you know, that's the fancy anthropological uh savvy term for the Sasquatch and you know, I don't think that's a crazy idea that there may have been other forms. Again, you know, the uh, the old idea had been once that well we know that there were Neanderthals and there are modern humans and as recently as the 1960s, I mean a lot of anthropologists looked at this as the uh, I guess in the terms of the single species hypothesis, right? But of course, we know that Neanderthals lived alongside modern humans. They interbred. And then, of course, we find the Denisovans, Homo floresiensis. There are some disputed ancient archaic human types like the Red Deer Cave people from Yunnan province and others. And so now we're having to broaden our understanding, right, of the dynamics of different hominin interactions during the Pleistocene. And on account of that, it certainly raises some questions. And I'm by no means the only person who's anthropologically inclined who's actually raised this point. Maybe we need to be more open-minded to the possibility that there could have been other kinds of humans or human-like, uh, you know, entities, organisms, what have you, mm -hmm. that have existed and persisted until more recently. Uh, of course, the most tantalizing proposition would be that some could have persisted until like today and may actually still be extant. And that would be what Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum, but a number of others since probably the 19, oh gosh, at least the 80s, probably going back even earlier than that, have referred to as uh, generally relict hominoids. Sometimes you see relic hominids. 
But again, the better term would be relict hominoids because they're not quite human, but they're kind of shaped like us and they are a holdover from an earlier time. So I'm working on a book that looks at the historical and the anthropological perspectives applied to that and also what science may have to say about it. And again, call me a skeptic, but I'm equally skeptical of modern skeptics who claim that this is a simple cut and dry, open and, book, uh, open and shut you know, case. Many of the skeptical writings that claim to be able to easily debunk the idea of the North American Sasquatch, you know, or something along those lines. I mean, as outlandish as that idea seems, and I'll concede that much, but the skeptical research is actually very poorly researched. And I'm simply saying you don't even have to advocate their existence or their, you know, the lack of evidence for that. Let's just get the history straight and not have a university press publish a bunch of shoddy research just because it conforms to a certain ideological perspective. So all I want, again, this all comes back to the truth. I just want the truth. I just want the facts. Call me Dragnet. Just the facts, ma'am. But, you know, that's what I'm working on. And I'm trying to get, you know, the facts of the historical narrative related to that subject, or at very least the idea of it down on paper. And I'm already about 25,000 words in and I'm on chapter two. So it's going to be a long nice. book. Nice. <laughs> you know, looking, looking forward to that, Michael. We should have you on when we go. Uh... When you're finished with that, absolutely. Uh, tell people where they can find. I mean, like your great podcasts and 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 so much more. You still do middle theory? I am. Um, yeah, I do. I do middle theory every week, and of course, you know, because of the relic hominoid in, uh, interest, I've got a separate podcast I do about that. It's called Sasquatch Tracks, and so all my podcasts. The simplest way to do this, if you just go to Micah Hanks, my name MicahHanks dot com forward slash shows. You can find links to where you can subscribe to all my shows. But again, everything I do is at micahanks.com. Perfect. Perfect. And, and Dave, what's next for you, man? And also thank you for helping set this up today. No, thanks for uh, having us. It's been a great time. And thanks to, to Micah and Terry for uh, coming through last minute for sure. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. What's next for me? Um, I'm working on a few different, uh, upcoming TV series uh, based on the paranormal, UFO. I'm working on a UFO documentary for Showtime, and hopefully soon I'm going out with the group out to the Pacific Ocean to find some Tic Tacs. So cool. wait nice. and see. Very, very nice, guys. Yeah, this has been excellent. Uh, thank you for coming on. And, uh, guys, I guess we're going to close the interview out here and uh, – We'll be back to close out the show on Conspiracy Normal. Good night. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Okay, we are back, and uh, we took a little bit of a break between what you just heard and what you're hearing now, because in between time, we did the Strange Realities Conference 2020. Wow. Just yeah. wow. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, it went very, very well. Yeah, it was um, an absolute success. I think I was a little trepidatious about it because it's not something that we had done before. Um, it was pretty ambitious in the fact that we had about 21 speakers spread over three days or rather two day, two days and a night. So we had had like uh, four speakers on Friday night, nine on Saturday and eight on Sunday. So Saturday and Sunday were pretty full days for us. Yeah, yeah, to say the least. We were manning the uh the boards, so to speak, with uh our good friend Ren. We couldn't have done it without him. Yeah. Um he really came through and helped us uh kind of direct the whole thing. Really uh helpful let us uh because we, we honestly we didn't expect, I don't think, to do as much moderation as we did. Um but we kind of did a lot of the uh led a lot of the question and answer sessions and uh 
it's just a whole lot, a whole lot going on. So it was almost like a giant three day conspiracy normal show. Yeah, it really was in many ways. And we, we kind of had gotten a little bit of practice on that doing those preview episodes, but yeah, I didn't expect that we, like you said, I didn't expect that we would go in and we would talk about, talk to, talk to the guests as much or the presenters as they are called in a conference as much as we did on this one. Um, some of the presenters got finished a little earlier than others. So we hopped in and there was like, of course, like a time lag where we were like, well, questions, if anybody wants questions. So we know, of course, people got to type those out. It's not like a, you know, it's not like a live conference where you can just raise your hand and ask your question. But uh, I actually, you know, we actually ended up having plenty of questions for the presenters. So I think it worked out really well. And the person that got the most questions was actually Timothy Renner. He finished up about like 45 minutes early and uh, was um, was got the most questions of, of anybody else. And like Serfiel mentioned, um, Ren Collier really came through for us. And he pretty much did like the, all the little interstitials and little bumpers. And you know, we had a couple of films that Serfiel and I put in there. And he just kind of made all that kind of flawless for us. We were trying to do that at the beginning of the conference, but it just became too, uh, too much for us. And at a certain point we were like, like, why don't you just take this over? And it became pretty much seamless after that. Yeah. So it was a little bit of a rough start, but this is all a learning process and just thanks everyone for being patient. Um, but the, uh, as far as the actual, um, presentations themselves they all went relatively smoothly and uh, were really great uh, we just want to thank you to all the speakers and all the attendees um, we had loyal listeners there and then uh, i mean if you're listening now if you're a new listener then welcome to conspire normal we pretty much feel like you're a part of the family now um, so if you had a good time there, you can check out all of our old episodes and you'll see a lot of familiar faces, hear a lot of familiar voices. Um, we just had great interactivity. Um, a lot of people commented that there were some kind of continuous threads throughout some of the presentations, which wasn't necessarily planned. It just kind of, um, these people are kind of just in a, in a community and, uh, share a lot of similar ideas that uh connect to each other so that was cool and, um and uh a lot of the attendees said this was their first con so that's awesome to you know uh, to to provide that for people and uh tim banal in particular said that it he still had that feeling you know post conference like um uh, you know we still brought that conference feel and a lot of interactivity, a lot of people got to know us, we got to know them, and and the attendees really got to know each other. We had the two hangouts. Um, so it was just a great entire weekend that really captured that same feeling as much as we could in the in the virtual realm. Yeah. We really felt like we had been we had been to a convention. And uh, that's that's that was really great great to kind of replicate that. Um was there any presenters that, uh, you know, cause like Serfiel and I were like busy doing a lot of things. So it was kind of hard for us to like pay attention to a lot of the presenters unless I was over here, which I was doing some of the PowerPoints. I was actually, um, they were telling me next slide and we were going from, from, I was going from side to side. So I was kind of paying attention a little bit more then, but, uh, you know, still there was, you know, I had to communicate with Ren and, uh, uh, Sophia and I communicated back and forth, so we didn't get to see. We still felt like you know, <laughs> again at like a real con, like last year. I didn't get to see a lot of the a lot of those uh, presentations, and uh, we're gonna go back and and really watch them. But was there anyone that kind of stood out to you? Um, n not in particular, but there is a few people who this was their first. Uh, their, their first time presenting at some kind of con and all of them really, you know, knocked it out of the park and it was, it was, you know, such, such fresh material, um, that, uh, was really impressed and we're glad we could provide, um, a conference for them to start, start exploring doing that. 
Um, I believe it was Stephanie Quicks, um, Recluse, Ren, and was there anyone else who was there first? Red Pill Junkie. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and, and Red Pill Junkie. Mm -hmm. And all those were great presentations, and uh, we're glad we could – you know, provide that opportunity for them to, uh, to, to get their feet wet in, uh, in doing this. And, uh, hopefully they'll be speaking at more cons in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's hope so. I was particularly impressed by Ren, uh, especially he gave a very, at the end of his presentation, he got pretty powerful and pretty profound. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, very impressed by him and he was actually, you know, pulling double duty at the time. So that made it even more impressive. Um, and we had some, you know, some veterans that have given presentations before like Brent Rains and Reverend Michael Carter, and Dr. Future, uh, Greg Bishop and Timothy Renner, Joshua Cutchin, just to name a few people yeah. that have, that have done this before. And David Metcalf, totally fresh cutting edge material. Yeah. And uh, Saturday was kind of a theme, you know, I didn't really set it up that way, except for obviously for Jack and, and Jack Montgomery and Tony Kale. Uh, that was, um, that was more like, you know, they, they did, they were doing kind of a joint presentation and they did, they did two halves of the same presentations essentially. Yeah. Which those were really good. But also, you know, that had to do with folk magic, but also, you know, David Metcalf's uh, was on the same day and that had to do with folk magic too. And there was a little bit of that also in Kiki Dombrowski's presentation, which started out on Saturday. Um, so anybody that listened to the, uh, watched the presentations, uh, are, are you signed up for Stranger Realities Conference 2020? They are still up. Um, if you have not had the chance to watch any of these presentations, they are still available. Um, we're going to have you. to, yeah, we're going to have to go back and, It'll probably be like us attending it for the first time as well, because uh, like Adam was saying, we were really busy doing a, a lot of things at the same time. Didn't really get to just sit back and enjoy the presentations. I really am looking forward to being able to do that. And also, too, um, at the end of the Saturday night and the end of Sunday night, we did both. We did two after parties. Yeah. Which lasted yeah. essentially both to like one o'clock in the morning for us. So that was uh, <laughs> that was also pretty fun. Yeah, and help help build that community for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Is there any other insights that you or things that you wanted to kind of cover about it? I'm just really proud. We did this really guerrilla style, and uh, we had to learn along the way. We're not the most technically savvy people, um, and uh, I just think we really it was a great success. And to uh, I think we got a lot of new new people in the fold and uh to all the new conspiracy normal listeners uh welcome and mm -hmm. especially to all the loyal ones um you know welcome welcome back and we hope we gave you something extra and uh we hope it was a good reflection of the podcast uh itself so uh, yeah i'm just i'm really proud and i can't wait to go back and really watch these uh in the shoes of an attendee just a uh, quick things about my impressions about everything. Uh, I was really, really impressed first off with recluse. Uh, he was a first time, uh, presenter. And another one that really impressed me was Dr. Future. We pretty much went all the way up to time with him. Uh, it was funny because he said, are there any questions after we got through all 74 of his slides, a uh, pretty extensive presentation and uh, I was very really impressed with him and also Ren and, and, a, and a few others. And Joshua Cutchin really knocked it out of the park at the end of the end of Sunday night as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Just everybody. Thanks. Thanks so much for making this possible and making it possible for next year. We feel like we've got the digital con down and uh, we, you know, really, really figured out the, the real life version last year. So we expect that um, if things go well next year, we can do some kind of hybrid event, which would still allow, you know, all the people who couldn't come to attend in some way. And then we could bring that live component back at the same time. 
Um, so that that is our our greatest hope here, and you all uh, definitely made this possible. Okay, well that's it, guys. Um, we have actually taken a break this week, uh, so you may have noticed that there was no show in the previous week. But that's because we just did like a extremely long conference, and but uh, we will be back next time with uh, Robert Guffey. So come join us and. We just remember Patreon, Conspiracy Normal, if you're interested in, in donating to Patreon, it's oh, $1. Yes, and there is um, on our T Public site, we have Strange Realities gear. So you yep. can get uh, quite a few designs on uh, T-shirts, hoodies, and other swag, stickers, stuff like that, coffee mugs. Absolutely. All right, I think that's it. I think we'll call it. Uh, just remember, uh, conspiranormal.com, YouTube channel, Conspiranormal Podcast. Uh, we are going to be just focusing on Conspiranormal for just a little bit before we even start planning for Strange Realities 2021, whatever form that may take. And we're going to see you next week on Conspiranormal. Please check out our YouTube channel, Conspiranormal Podcast.